Hello and welcome. This is For A Better Tomorrow, the University of Derby's innovation and research podcast with me, Lewis Allsop. Each episode, I chat to someone in academia about the innovation and research they're working on, which is going to make our lives better. Now, previously, I've spoken to researchers about topics like how can mirrors help us to make solar energy more efficient and how we can use computers to help us understand the world. But today, I want to talk to you about Alzheimer's. My granddad had it, and as horrible as it was, it often felt like he couldn't have done anything to help it. But what if now, new research is finding ways that we could, using proteins? Well, today I'm joined by Professor Myra Conway, who's theme lead in biomedical sciences at the University of Derby. Thank you so much for coming over. Before we get into all of that, just tell me a bit about yourself, first of all. So I'm a biochemist by trade and I've got a background over 20 years experience in biomedical research. I come from Cork in Ireland and I worked for five years in the US as a research fellow studying the structure function relationship of proteins, something that really excited me. I then travelled back to the UK and um, I started my career as a lecturer and progressed through lecturer, senior lecturer, associate prof, prof, all the way through in biomedical science. Lovely. Um, very briefly to start off and then we'll expand on it. What's the focus of your research? So I have a number of different projects that I'm interested in and they largely span the understanding of how mechanisms underpin disease pathology. And the two main diseases that we're looking at in our group are Alzheimer's disease, which is a form of dementia, and breast cancer. So very much understanding the the ways that these diseases progress in the human body. As an aside to that, we also look at biomarkers. So markers that might appear in um, blood or urine or CSF, for example, which can indicate the transition from early stage disease to late onset. So these are the things, I suppose, that are the warning signs, aren't they? They're the orange light before we get to red of these terrible, debilitating diseases. But it's about, I suppose, catching them early. My granddad had Alzheimer's, so I want to talk a little bit about that. What are you working on at the moment in your research with Alzheimer's? So with respect to Alzheimer's, we're looking at how dietary proteins and dietary nutrition can alter these mechanisms in the brain. We're really keen to understand that relationship between um, your gut health and your brain health. So fundamentally, we're trying to understand the, the mechanisms or pathways that clear clogged up protein in the brain. So in an Alzheimer's disease, when somebody progresses into the end stage of the condition, if you look down a microscope at a section of a brain, you will see that there's clumps or aggregates in the brains of these individuals. So what we're trying to do and understand is how these clumps gather and build up and can we unpick the stages at, by which this happens and control it through changes in our diet. Now, when you say protein, and apologies for being ignorant, I think of, you know, a steak for tea on a That's Friday That's right, night. yeah, I know. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, do you know what? The concept is, can be really hard to describe. So you are absolutely right. In your, in your dietary meal, so if you eat your steak, for example, you have that protein present and that build up a smaller component parts called amino acids. So when you eat that steak and you digest it, it's broken down into these smaller parts and these then flow from your, your gut into your bloodstream. And these now are those smaller parts. But then in your body, all of these elements are repackaged, if you like, into functional units called proteins in your body. And these carry out different functions. So in, there's in not the steak travelling around my body. <laughs> no, there isn't. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I guess there's a form of, it's broken down into pieces. <laughs> so obviously your research looking at Alzheimer's and the way that proteins, these, these little clumps sort of form in your brain and develop and almost cause the, the early stages. Is it to do with what you eat or is it sort of like an involuntary reaction? 
No. So there are a number of different theories as to how these clumps and aggregates form. There is a genetic component, which they believe represents about one to five percent of cases. So if you carry that gene, then you will present early. So around anything from the age of 30 to 40 to 50. So these are considered early onset dementia, whereas those in the late onset, which can present from any age from 65 to 70 onwards, this is late onset. The causes of the disease um, are considered to be multi-component or multi-factorial. They don't know exactly what causes the disease. However, what they do know is, is that there's a change in the processing or the pathway or the mechanism whereby normally these um, toxic components are cleared from the brain but in Alzheimer's disease they are no longer cleared there's something wrong with that clearance mechanism and also with the whole processing of that protein so the protein keeps being built up and it's not being cleared I liken it to recycling Okay, so if you take your recycling at home, we go to, um, you know, you go to your recycling bins, you've got your plastics, your cardboards, so on and so forth. So we package these up and we distribute them into your bin bags or whatnot. That's what the cell does as well. So it packages up these components in the cell that it no longer needs or it may reutilize it or repurpose it just like our recycling does. So some components are going to be discarded because they definitely don't want them. But some components will be recycled and repackaged into new things that the cell can use, just like we use our recycling. So in the case of Alzheimer's disease, that recycling process is no longer functional. So we just, we, we become hoarders. <laughs> That's a great way of describing it. Yeah, we actually become hoarders, yeah. Well, the cells do. Like they're they're kind of hanging on to this stuff that they don't really need. So what have you found or what are you looking to find? What is your sort of end goal with this mm-hmm. research? We've already evidence to indicate that there are certain components of a diet that can change the, the direction of this clearance pathway. And we've shown it in models. So there are ways to represent what may be going on in the human brain. What I'd love to do is take those models and translate them to an actual human um, um, you know, outcome, such that if we have a better understanding how these components of our diet change these clearance mechanisms in the brain, can we um, include as part of your treatment regime or even as part of our normal diet, do we consider X amount of a particular you know, nutritional supplement to help us improve the clearance or the getting rid of this buildup of this, these plaques in your brain. So in the real world, I suppose, we, we hear a lot about, um, you know, um, people with uh, certain types of cancers and how, mm. say, smoking can help to contribute to gaining lung cancer, I suppose. Mm. I suppose this is a very similar look. We get a pathway that, you know, eating this may cause this or whatever. Is that what you're sort of trying to understand? It's not cause, it's more control. So it's regulation. So if we take, for example, diabetes or cardiovascular disease, so a lot is understood about those pathways and how that occurs, especially the heart disease element. We know that if we have a diet that will end result in that plaque formation in, in the vessels of the heart, that will contribute to cardiovascular disease. Similarly, with respect to diabetes, that has two forms, your type 1 and your type 2 form. But that's all about controlling your glucose levels. But it's also about controlling your triglycerides, so your fats and um, and your proteins, actually. So they're all interlinked. And interestingly enough, um, recent studies have demonstrated that those with type 2 diabetes, so and more so in the uncontrolled, so if you're not controlling your diabetes well, there's got a 50% increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. That, together with cardiovascular conditions, it indicates that dietary or lifestyle choices, so it's not just diet, it's about your lifestyle as well. So exercise, you know, um, how are you, you know, um, keeping your brain active? So it's not about your physical um, muscles, it's also about your cognitive muscles. Are you keeping that exercised? So collectively, diet, exercise, that will fundamentally improve not just your body health, which we normally associate it with, but also your brain health, because that is not really 
out there, I think, as much as it should be. We're, we're kind of interested in the concept healthy heart, healthy brain. And that's an element that we would like to, I think, um, encourage folks to think about. How does this affect someone like me? So I'm a, I'm a young person just starting my adult life. Will this change how, as a society, we sort of react to Alzheimer's disease and actually can prevent it? It's not preventing because we still don't know enough about these pathways. Okay. However, what it could do is potentially delay disease onset. So you're actually very right. For somebody who who are in their early 20s, 30s, you do need to be thinking about brain health because in Alzheimer's disease, what the current um, thinking in the research community is, at least, is, is that the disease is starting decades before it actually clinically presents. So before somebody shows mild cognitive impairment. So the damage is already being done. It's the exact same as your, your heart. A lot of people don't find out they've got cardiovascular disease until they present with a myocardial infarction so those are things we do need to consider so yes you absolutely should be thinking of your brain health so what are things that we can do now if it's someone my age is there anything that I can do now that will that will help me out at this moment in time exactly what I said healthy heart healthy diet exercise they certainly won't be a bad thing and it's no harm for people to think about it in the context of their brain as well as you know the rest of their body In a couple of sentences, would you mind just summing up? I know it's very difficult. (laughs) Just summing up your your research, what you want to what you want to find. I would really like to find how um, a dietary um, supplement or intervention can delay disease onset in Alzheimer's disease. Do you think you'll do it? Oh gosh, yes. I, I'm, I'm actually really confident. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah. good. Like I say, it's, a, it's, it's a subject that's close to my heart with mm-hmm. my granddad having dementia, um, Alzheimer's, and it's something that has always been seen to me, I suppose, as something that he couldn't help. Do you know what I mean? So if there's something that we can do yeah. to help it mm. with this research, then I think that's amazing. Thank you very much for talking to me. Pleasure. That is Professor Myra Conway, the theme lead in biomedical sciences at the University of Derby. And that is it for today's episodes of For a Better Tomorrow, the University of Derby's innovation and research podcast. In other episodes, I've looked at the research answering questions like why inter-business relationships are so important to our daily lives and why is singing so good for us. So be sure to check them out wherever you get your podcasts and follow the university at Derby Uni. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. For a Better Tomorrow was presented by me, Louis Ulsop, and produced by myself and Dr. Darhi McMahon in the School of Arts for the University of Derby.